Yes. All right, good evening and thank you for everybody who's able to join us tonight. Um, we have about 18 people with us so far and we're looking forward to more people chiming in. And of course we are recording this um, Zoom event so we can send it out to everybody who wasn't able to be with us at this time. Um, my name is Tamara Park. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the Executive Director of Breck Music. And I hope each and every one of you is at home, safe and comfortable in all that you and your families are well. Um, this, everyone here in this Zoom event is a donor of ours. And we are truly grateful for your trust and support during this really wild and unprecedented time. So thank you for making a gift um, and enabling us to continue to thrive and grow and and evolve in this environment. So while the experience of music in Breckenridge is irreplaceable, we are delighted to bring you this new program, Applause at Home. And our hope with this program is to provide you, our loyal donors and music enthusiasts, with safe opportunities to engage with music, our musicians, and, um, and with each other as well. And so this is our, our first go at it, and we're so glad that you're with us. Um, thanks also to the many gifts that we've received in this time, we've invested in two other programs uh, appropriate to this coronavirus environment. One is um, specifically serving a population in our community that has been hit hard with, with the social isolation that uh, the quarantine brought. And um, so we are partnering with Building Hope on a program called HYPE for teens age 14 through 20 and um, using music as a tool to bring together small groups of eight students and two adults um, to have experiences that are social and supported by adults um, and fun and rewarding for those teens too. We also are working with Breck Create and the town of Breckenridge to support our local downtown businesses by animating Walkable Main in Breckenridge with pop-up performances by local musicians on the Riverwalk Center lawn and on the Arts District campus. Um, so if you have any questions about either of those two programs. Uh, we'll have some time at the end of this session to really talk and I'm happy to answer any questions um, or tell you more about either of those programs. But today we're really focused on applause at home. And this certainly has been a labor of love specifically for our many, many applause volunteers who have been a part of it. Uh, we certainly wouldn't be in this position uh, where we have our staff and our artists collectively here uh, without the leadership of our applause committee. And I'd like to specifically thank Sandy Kuchineris, Laura Dietzik, Carol Weller, Jerry Gasparit, and the chair of applause, Janie Trowbridge, for all of their time and expertise in putting this program together. And I'd also like to just invite Janie to say a few words as well about applause as we get started here. Well, I'd like to start out by proposing a toast. I did make the French 75 that was in the recipes for this week's digest. And I want to mention, first of all, Tamara and her staff for doing a super job, my fellow applause members, and our artistic director and conductor, Stephen Schick. It's been a delightful process, and I know challenging at times. So I want to tell you a little bit about applause. It's the fundraising arm of Breck Music, as you know, and we provide hundred in the past, let's say, we've provided about $150,000 to toward Breck Music's budget. And the way we do this is by staging a number of activities. And in the past, these activities have included a Tex-Mex event, uh, a membership picnic in the summer, 
the a gala, which this year was going to be Bourbon Street Boogie, Champagne Brunch, which my husband Russ and I have hosted for the past 10 years. And we started doing cruises, fundraising cruises. And unfortunately, the one to North America had to be canceled. So I want to thank all those who worked on those activities that were planned beautifully in typical applause style, but which didn't take place. But stay tuned. We will have more creative ideas for you in the future. Now, how do you become a member of Applause? Well, most of you already are. And if you aren't, it's at least $50 donation to, to join us. So I just wanted to say one more thing, and that is why I joined Applause when we first came here 15 years ago. I have two musician daughters, so I know a little bit about the life of musicians, and they promised me they'd tune in. And one is a music therapist and a singer in the Minneapolis, in the Minnesota Corral. And so she's very busy at this time because of coronavirus. And so I really appreciate that Brett Music is working with Building Hope on this program to help teens. And then the other one is a percussionist and I've introduced her to Conductor Schick. And she's talked about the difficulties of teaching percussion, especially for mallets uh, to middle schoolers. So anyway, I hope you'll keep in touch with us and that we'll see you at future events. Thank you, Janie. Um, I do see, I see Carolyn here with us as an attendee. So she, uh, she is a good daughter and is um, supporting us now. So thank you, Carolyn. Um, you know, clearly this is not your typical concert setting and we want all of our attendees here tonight to feel as comfortable in this environment as you do in the Riverwalk Center um, and to use the tools available uh, to ask questions and interact with us and, and with the music itself as well. So tonight's program will begin with a talk by our artistic director and conductor, Stephen Schick. Um, we then we will essentially replay a program um, produced by the festival orchestra in 2019 last summer of Beethoven's seventh symphony and between each movement Steve will make comments and answer your questions um, and this should just take under an hour. Uh, then if you care to stay and ask more questions, please do. We, we would love to chat and talk to you and, and learn more and get your feedback on how you think this went too. Um, so to communicate with us, we're recommending that you only use the chat icon at the bottom of the screen. So you'll see right now we're sharing a screen where you can see that chat um, speech bubble there at the bottom. We would prefer that you don't use the Q&A and raise your hand functions just because we want to keep it as simple as possible. And to use the chat, we recommend that you open that chat window now so that we can, as panelists, see um, everything that you're saying and all of your comments and that you too can see what other people are saying about the music or the questions that you're asking. Um, so you can open that window and move it up to the corner of your screen so it's out of the way of the faces of our presenters. And then if you haven't used chat in a, this web, webinar version previously, you can see in the red circle there that um, there is a drop down button and we recommend that you always use the choice of all panelists and attendees. And that way everybody can see what you're asking. Um, of course, you can just ask us panelists questions, but we really want this to be a dialogue among community members as well. And then you simply check, uh, type in your chat question right under that, um, that drop down menu 
it, where it says your text can be seen by panelists and other attendees. So please use that. And we might just take a moment now um, to, to give it a shot. So um, if, if you have your chat open, uh, we'd love to know um, who chose to make a recipe from applause now. And we can, it looks like Brenda is here. Hi, hi Brenda, thank you for joining us tonight. And did anybody make any of the recipes other than Janie, of, of course, who's made the French 75. Um, I just, I think I have a, an old bottle of Pinot Grigio from an applause function last year. Um, Oh, Carol says she already made and ate the key lime pie. That's terrific, terrific. Well, Julie, can you, um, we can stop the screen share now because I think everybody can see that we, um, how to use this function. Looks like Karen is here. Hi, Karen, thank you again for, for organizing and then canceling that remarkable cruise that we had planned with applause. We're so glad you and Jim are, are here drinking that French 75. So we encourage you during this webinar not to be shy. Is that Russ, I imagine? Hi, Russ. Um, uh, we imagine uh, that this is a very dynamic process and we encourage you to use this chat, webinar chat, and ask us questions, hard questions, personal questions, questions about how we've been doing or what we've been doing it during this quarantine period and now as things are opening back up. Um, and, and of course, questions about, about the music, uh, most importantly. Um, so I will, now that everybody knows how to use the chat, let's, um, let's begin tonight's program. So it's my deep, deep pleasure as always, and I very much miss the opportunity to see Brenda and Steve in person this summer um, to introduce our, our festival artistic director and conductor, Stephen Schick. Um, as many of you know, he is one of today's most revered percussionists but also an incredible conductor, writer, and distinguished professor at UCSD, um, just with the, the highest level of musicianship. And we're so fortunate to have him involved with our, our organization. Um, in fact, today, he, it was announced that he is the recipient of Columbia University's 2020 Ditson's Conductors Award for the advancement of American music. And this is a very high honor. And he shares this with other past recipients such as David Zimmerman, um, Alan Gilbert of the New York Philharmonic, Leonard Bernstein, Marin Alsop. Um, so again, it's a huge honor to have him with us today. And Steve has been hunkering down in his home in San Diego, in fact, in his garage, as you can see. Uh, since March, uh, he and Brenda had planned a whirlwind tour of Asia and Australia, which was canceled. Um, and during that time, he graciously helped us think up this, um, this substitute, which really is never a substitute for live music, but uh, this program applause at home to, for us to continue to engage with our community and to bring our the very many special people that make all of this possible together, even if um, from afar. So Steve, thank you so much uh, for thinking of this and for bringing us uh, this presentation tonight. Thank you so much, Tamara, and welcome everybody. Um, as Brenda said, we will so miss our time in Breckenridge this summer, but just because we're not there does not mean that you're not topmost in our minds, and, and, and you really are. So uh, this chance to have some contact with each other is really, really been, uh, it's been hope giving, frankly, so thank you very much. Now, you may be familiar with the, the website Rate the Room that rates all the rooms of the Zoom calls that you see on the 24 hour news shows and everything like that. The room that I am in right now will not win that award. 
I, have, I am here in our garage. You can see right behind me, uh, Laundry Facilities. It is a studio uh, space that I've been using since the middle of March when we could no longer be on campus at the University of California in San Diego. And to my left, I have a, a vibraphone and some percussion instruments. And uh, right over there is a, a rack to dry, uh, to dry clothes on. So this is where I've lived. And so rather than go into the living room where perhaps the, the scene would be more pleasant. I wanted to show you where I've been working. In point of fact, just this last week, um, I've been allowed to go back to my studio on campus and it has been a joy to be able to touch those instruments again. Uh, so anyway, welcome to the garage. This is where I spent my time. As Tamara said, we're going to be talking about Beethoven's Seventh Symphony uh, and listening to a performance that we did together at the end of last summer's season. It's important to note right now that Beethoven, uh, we're celebrating his 20, 250th uh, uh, anniversary of his birth. So it's been a big Beethoven year and you, you, you never know what to give somebody that apparently has everything as Beethoven seems to. And so what we would like to do is to give you the fond memories of this performance that we did uh, actually less than a year ago together on the stage of the Riverwalk Center. Now, a lot of people ask, and I suppose they ask more in times of difficulty such as these, why should we care about classical music? What, what relevance does this music have on our lives? Can it help us? Can it help us in any greater extent than, than a sort of simple balm, something pretty to listen to, to take our minds off the troubles that we have? And of course, I am uh, completely in favor of a balm and an entertainment and beautiful music uh, but I would offer that there is something really important about Beethoven and classical music, classical era music in general. Now, when I talk about classical era music, and we're talking about Beethoven and Mozart and Haydn, we're really talking about music of the late 18th century and the early 19th century. So more than 200 years uh, old, which again begs the question, how is this relevant to ourselves now and right, right now? But I would offer this that a classical symphony, and they are, there is no better example of them than the symphonies of Beethoven, are basically studies in wholeness, in organicity, in bringing disparate parts together to make a harmonious, harmonious whole. So all of the parts of the, of the piece must fit together uh, to make a compelling musical narrative. Each instrument has its function and works along the side, uh, the side of the others. There's a balance between loud and soft. There's a uh, between uh, slow and fast, between dense and sparse. In other words, what Beethoven has created as, as, a, as a symphony is a fully functioning universe. This universe is a universe of equality where you can have all of the different kinds of instruments and they sound different and some are louder and softer than others, but functioning together, they form a society that is whole and is built on equality. And in fact, this music is the musical symbol, the musical totem, if you'll pardon that expression, of the French and American re uh, revolutions. It is that kind of equality sounded in music. So when we listen to a Beethoven symphony, for example, and it sounds right to us, it sounds balanced, it sounds whole, what we're essentially doing is reflecting on the ideologies that have governed the way communities have related to, to each other since the Enlightenment, have governed the way we have structured our, 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 our governments, our classes, our families, even our rapport with nature. All of the, everything that has grown out of the rich soil of the American and French revolutions in terms of how we relate to one another can be heard in this music. So when we wonder how we can get life back on an even keel, and I think you probably share these feelings with me of wondering where will we go? How can we find balance again in such difficult times. I often listen to classical music because that is the living, breathing, sonic representation of just that world. So when we peer into the mind of Beethoven, we're really peering into the mind of equality. We're peering into the mind of his colleagues, Immanuel Kant, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and a number of thinkers in both Europe and the United States at that time. And the Seventh Symphony of Beethoven is probably, if I were to choose, the most beautiful example of that kind of wholeness, this would be the piece. It is 
entertaining, but it is more than that. To understand why we care about this piece, let's just take a, a little look at where this piece came in Beethoven's output. This piece was made in 1812, at the same time uh, as the composition of the Eighth Symphony, which followed very closely, and comes at the end of what a lot of people think of as Beethoven's middle period. This is a period that is marked by, by maturity, by his interest in deep and sometimes personal dramatic thoughts of a narrative that was profound. Um, but it comes also after a kind of frenetic period in his life where he was doing one piece after another, after another, after another. To give you an example of that, of the earlier, of, of the earlier period, at the very end of 1808, he had a famously long and, by the way, very, very cold concert in December of 1808 in Vienna. You can imagine what that was like, uh, in which was, on which was premiered the Fifth Symphony and the Sixth Symphony, the Fourth Piano Concerto, the Choral Fantasy, and a number of, num number of small pieces. It was a four and a half or five hour long concert, according to reports, and it just symbolized the fact that Beethoven was this font of energy, a sort of titanic um, a source of, of, of pure musical impulse. Um, after that moment, Beethoven slowed down just a little bit. He wrote music in a lot of different kinds of styles, not just the large symphonic or orchestral styles, and the music became more personal. It became about the natural world, if we listen to you know, what happened after the Pastoral Symphony. It became about his fraught and unhappy relationship with with love and we think of the eighth symphony and the immortal beloved as a as an example so we have here this beautifully balanced moment coming after the after the incredible energy of the of, of the early period and before the deep poetic music of his late period and so if a symphony equals balance the seventh symphony is the point in Beethoven's life upon which everything pivots. So we are hearing the epitome, in essence, of balance. So a symphony, which has to go all together, consists of a number of movements. These are sort of, you, you know what, the, what movements are. They're, they're standalone pieces that don't really stand alone. They need the context of the other movements to make sense. But they have their qualities. The first movement is often one of announcing, of, of exposing the themes and of working through ideas. It's often very intricate in terms of its form and harmony and its thematic ideas. The second movement in the Beethoven Symphony is often a song-like one. Uh, mostly that is the case, and certainly is in the Seventh Symphony. The third movement is a dance, usually in a meter of three, built on the minuet, or in some, in some cases what, what Beethoven called a scherzo. And the last movement, you never really know, but you can be sure that in a, in a Beethoven Symphony, it's going to end with energy. All of these things are parts of his universe. Now, Beethoven listened to his world. How do I want to, how do I want to put this? Some critics talk about the rhythms of the first movement of, of the Seventh Symphony as being indebted to ancient Greek poetry. Uh, there's a sort of dactylic rhythm that goes on, uh, long, short, long, short, long. And, and that's true, but it's not right. What Beethoven was doing, in my opinion, was listening to the sounds of nature. So he begins with a long, slow introduction. It was very much in the style of the classical period, and he inherited that from Haydn. This one is especially long and especially rich. But when it breaks, as it will, into the fast movement of the first music, you can hear the sounds of horses. This is a piece of, this is an entire symphony about what it feels like to dance. And the first dance is not given to people, but to animals. And I think this is just an amazing thought that Beethoven was drawing his inspiration, even if he couldn't really actually at this point in his life hear it, but drawing it from the natural world. So I think what we should do is listen to the first movement of the symphony together. I have my score, the one that I took off my stand at the end of the performance last, uh, last August. I actually haven't opened it since then. I perused it today. And I have all kinds of notes about what we decided to do as an orchestra. It's really fascinating to look through it again. We'll listen to that. And I would urge you to 
um, to Luelu, first of all, I'd urge you to listen exactly how you wish to. This is the one thing we still have the right to do. Listen to music as we want. But if you have questions for me, then please do post them in the chat line and we can talk a little bit about what we've heard after we've heard the, the piece. So let's start by listening to the first movement of the Beethoven Seventh Symphony. It's a piece written in 1812, and it is an, a slow introduction and then an allegro main body of the piece. I'm so eager to hear what we've done.
what a memory that brings back. I mean, my gosh, that orchestra sounds so fabulous. And that piece, oh, yeah, that's, that's extraordinary, isn't it? Um, I, don't, I did see a couple of questions, or at least one, about the rehearsals. And so maybe we'd talk a little bit about that, because it's, um, it's an interesting way of working in a professional orchestral situation, which you don't always see if you're familiar, for example, with rehearsals in theater or dance or something like that. So to think that we had two rehearsals, probably of a little bit more than an hour, but not really because we had other pieces on, the, on that program, and then a run through, a partial run through on the day of the concert, it just feels like so little. Well, I mean, it, it, is, it is. It feels that way sometimes to me as well. But the reason that this works is that the orchestral musicians who are so so beautifully trained and are such extraordinary artists in, 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 in those that come to Breckenridge every summer can play this piece. They already know the nuances of the score. They've already many, in many cases, played the piece multiple times before. So that the work together is, is really trying to unite a kind of style. How can we make this thing sound well together? And how can we make it sound good in, 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 in the space itself? So that's really the function of, of, of the rehearsals. And then, of course, there are, there are some moments where we just want to do a couple of things again and, and fix a few, few things. But largely, the rehearsal is one of, of well, since this is a cooking moment, one of letting these ingredients stew together to make a, a, suitable, a suitable dish. I do have to tell you, and since I know Brenda is listening to this just through, the, just through that wall, uh, there's a lizard in our garage, my dear, and um, he came right up next to me uh, while we were listening and sat for the longest time just sort of bobbing his head to Beethoven. So I don't know if we have more musically astute listeners here because of the three months of practicing I've been doing in the garage, but they do seem to like early 19th century music. Does anybody have a, 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 a thought that you'd like to or a question or an observation that you could put into the chat box or uh, otherwise, you know, it just more stories from me. I can, I can regale you with stories from my childhood on the farm, uh, if you'd like. Anybody? I'll keep my eyes on it. And if you have uh, thoughts that you'd like to share, I'll respond to them. And if not, then, then sit back and, and, and listen. As I, as I said earlier, a, a symphonic form is a multi-movement piece in which all of these things must fit together like a perfectly uh, functioning society. So that means that really classical music is a study in contrasts. So what you establish as the normal language, in this particular case, this is rhythmic, harmonically driven, intense, joyous music, will then be answered as soon as possible by a composer like Beethoven with something that is different from that. And the second movement is very often precisely that moment, a moment of song-like intention, sometimes a moment of poetic reflection, occasionally moments of sadness and things like that. The one exception to that, by the way, is in the Ninth Symphony in which Beethoven puts another fast movement as the second movement and saves the slow movement for the third. Uh, but he was throwing a lot of things up in the air and experimenting by that, by that point. So we find a sort of typical slow movement in the, in, in the Beethoven Seventh, except that it's not typical. It is, and, and you know, at the risk of overselling this, this is, for my taste, the most beautiful classical music ever made. If I had to choose the piece that I would happily go off into my desert island, um, you know, in, in addition to the Patsy Cline and Johnny Cash that I sent on my listening list to you all, I would choose this movement. It is sublime. And it is also, strangely, the, one of the shortest of the second movements of Beethoven symphonies. He, he has two kinds of music, and they really are opposites. Again, remember, classical music is this moment of, 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 uh, of, of opposition or of polarity, of contrast. So the first uh, music is in A minor, in, in, and you'll hear that it has a kind of somber tonality. Uh, even if you don't know what A minor is, I think you'll respond to the kind of the, the, the poetry of that tonality. And this is a form, and, and forgive me, I'll, I'll, I'll try to educate as little as possible here, but this is a form called a passacaglia. A passacaglia essentially means that the bass line goes through a cycle and then repeats. So you get this kind of repeating, ongoing bass line that goes all over and over, it repeats multiple times, against which new material appears in the upper voices. The effect of that 
is of this kind of insistence, this inevitability, this sort of sense that fate is drawing you forward through the music. That's the music in minor. And then really without a transition, and this is very strange in classical music, normally composers are so proud of their transitions because it shows how well they control their craft. But here Beethoven simply interrupts himself to give us this kind of lighthearted music in, um, in major. And those two forms, the minor and the major, toggle back and forth with each other, sort of with a slight bit of melancholy answered by uh, a sort of sense of uplifting. Now, he calls this movement Alleg Allegretto Scherzando. The Allegretto is a tempo reference. In other words, it's kind of fast, which again is sort of strange because slow, we think of the second movement as a slow movement. And, and it will sound sustained to you, but he doesn't want it to drag. He doesn't want it to sit and be stuck in, in, in the mud. And he calls it allegretto scherzando. Scherzando is a word, scherzare, the, the Italian verb means to joke. And so there is in the, in the, in the kernel, in the core of this, a kind of lightheartedness. This is, this is the beauty of the Beethoven slow movement. Every time Beethoven sets forth a somber, poetic, or even melancholy tone. He embeds in the middle of that the seeds that will germinate into lightness and brightness. So there's no such thing in Beethoven, or frankly, in any classical symphony that I can remember, as a, a, a purely melancholy moment. Within the melancholy is embedded the seeds of joy, and every time you see overt statements of joy, you are reminded that it grows out of the human condition, which in Beethoven's mind was fundamentally melancholy. So you have these mixtures of things. Again, remember that the goal of classical music is, is to establish wholeness. Um, the, um, the amount of material, let's put it this way. No, that's wrong. The amount of emotional impact in this slow piece is extraordinary. And yet the, the material itself is pretty limited, which gives us a lot of time, even in a short movement, to evaluate the subtle shadings of dark and light. Now imagine, as you might remember, if you are in the mountains now, but if you are watching from someplace else, you'll remember that afternoon in the mountains near Breckenridge are studies in shadow and sunlight, and that you see the burst of light, and then you'll see the, the clouds covering it, and, the, and there is this constant mobility between lightness and, and, and the covering of light. I think this is how I hear the second movement of the Beethoven Seventh Symphony. It is music that touches the heart, and we're so happy to share with you our performance, which took place on the final night of our festival last year of the Beethoven Seventh. This is an audio-only recording, but it is a superb recording. I'm very pleased to have a chance to, for you to listen to the second movement. Let's take a listen.
Well, that was the second movement of the Beethoven Seventh Symphony. And uh, as I said, I don't think it gets much more beautiful than that as, as music. And as I mentioned in the chat line, the string section um, is just glorious. And, and of course, we owe that to the entirety of the sections, but, uh, but the leadership there within each section, and I mentioned those folks by name, um, just, um, uh, just really wonderful. Uh, again, I'll, I'll keep looking at the, at the chat line to see if you've got any comments or questions you'd like me to respond to, and I'm happy to do that. But, it, but let's go back to the theme just for the moment about how Beethoven builds wholeness. First of all, about establishing opposing forces and then reconciling those forces into something that is whole. So wholeness to Beethoven does not, not mean unproblematic uniformity. In fact, to the opposite. Beethoven builds a kind of model for musical community out of things which are quite different from one another and finds a way of combining those things so that there is harmony among them. Again, um, we started the, the conversation with the question, how, what can we learn from classical music? And I think that really is directly applicable to our, to our time. How do we learn? How can we live together with people, ideas, places, and, 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 and impulses that are quite different from one another? And how can we make something that is harmonious? So we hear that worked out in every single movement of a Beethoven symphony, and we hear it really before our ears and our, our eyes. The third movement, as I said, uh, is normally a faster movement, and it is in, the, um, in a meter of three. Again, for those of you who are who will fear that I'm going to launch into a lecture about rhythm, never mind, I won't. But when we say something is in a rhythm, a meter of three, what we're saying is that every strong beat is demarcated into three subgroups. So it's one, two, three, 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 and that's fast. Sometimes you get one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So that there's a strong impulse every three, every three beats. That's how Beethoven builds the metrical structure of this, which is in a minuet and, and trio form. Um, the minuet and trio uh, come from Baroque ideas for dances. And so when you're listening to this, you should really imagine that this comes from dance music. And in essence, you could still dance to it if, if you wanted. Uh, and Beethoven does something kind of tricky here. Um, let's put it this way. Every symphony gradually ratchets up the intensity of the minuet and trio in, in, over the course of Beethoven's career until it's faster and louder and more intense, each one more than the other, until you frankly can't dance to it anymore. I, I really, I, I, I dare anybody to try to dance to the the minuet of the of the fifth symphony, for example, or um, but here he backs off just enough so that the form and the texture aerates a little bit, and we can hear the structure of three. We can imagine the dance that went along with it. Now back to the idea of opposing forms. The minuet and trio is a very predictable form. It starts with the minuet. And it has, that minuet has two parts, each of them repeat, and there is variation and contrast between. Then that whole thing, this is what we call the minuet, this two-part structure I just described, alternates and contrasts with the trio, which is itself a two-part structure. The minuet and the trio are fundamentally different in qualities, and each part, each of the two parts of the minuet and trio are different from each other. So in essence, there is a constant movement from one kind of assertion to another, where we are, pull, we are confronted with seemingly opposing impulses and Beethoven always finds a way of bringing them together. The trio of a minuet and trio is usually, and in, in, in fact, this is the case here, slower, more sustained, more poetic than the minuet. And so you have these moments in the minuet and trio form where you're enjoying a kind of soft and poetic moment and then you're snapped back into dance mode and then back comforted by the trio and then snapping back. Um, in fact, the, uh, the structure of the, of the Beethoven seventh third movement is a little complex and I won't take you through it, but you will hear this music return time and time again as those, the simple cohabitation of opposing musical forces will provide us with some kind of reconciliation and the basis for unity and organicity. 
Um, I think we should listen to this. It's not, a, it's not an overly long movement and it is really just delightful. Uh, so let us listen one more time to Beethoven's Seventh Symphony from our performance last year. This is the third movement, the minuet and trio. <laughs>
Amazing. It's totally amazing. Wonderful performance by the orchestra and just so lively. I, I so appreciated that I can hear myself sniff as I turn pages every once in a while. I was standing too close to the microphone. Um, it, Janie asked a, uh, asked a question in, in general about my, uh, by my garage and the kinds of working I, work I've been doing here. So before we continue with our um, our conversation about the Beethoven, let me tell you that, in fact, I've done quite a lot of teaching via Zoom, uh, both with my students here at the University of California, <clears throat> pardon me, but also at the San Francisco Conservatory, we are in the midst of perform, uh, preparing a performance of Messiaen's extraordinary From the Canyons to the Stars. And uh, that had to be canceled uh, because of the pandemic. And so I filled out the rest of the rehearsal time by giving courses on the relationship between music and the natural world. I've taught uh, re repeatedly, uh, or actually several master classes in Melbourne. This was last uh, last week, and so that is working at night here uh, for their morning the next day. Um, I've been on the on um, planning sessions uh, for an, a very very large theatrical production in Paris for the summer of 2022. So we're making good use of the technology, and uh, there is uh, a lot of teaching and a lot of work that can be done this way. So thank you for the question, uh, Janie, and. And so back uh, to the to the Beethoven, we have we have almost come full circle. We have 
had a kind of moment of introduction and thematic exposition in which the first movement sets forth all of the materials that we can expect to hear in the symphony. The second movement with its beautiful song and, uh, and slightly brighter dance. The third movement with its two kinds of dances. And so you can begin to see that this is a, this is a piece about the urge to move, about the dance. And of course, that's what we called last summer's season, songs and dances. This piece has both in, in, in abundance. Now, what you couldn't tell from this recording is how we manage the relationship between the third and the fourth movements. Uh, the the um, third movement of the Beethoven Seventh ends with such an upramp of energy that what we did in the performance, and maybe some of you remember this, was to move immediately into the fourth movement, uh, what, what we call a taka. In other words, attacking the, the beginning of the fourth movement immediately after the end of the third movement without, any, without letting anybody kind of breathe or, or lose the tension. And so if you can imagine that the third movement of the Beethoven is this huge ski jump. And we're right as we are speaking right now, suspended in midair, ready to take full advantage of the totality of the momentum uh, that we have going on, getting ready to come into the, into the last movement. Now, the last movement of every Beethoven symphony is, a, is, a, is basically an essay in extravagance. All of the rhythms, all of the themes, everything, all of the forces are brought to bear. You're, the idea is that you will not be left wanting more. So he's going to leave it completely on the playing field here for us. Um, but there is an interpretive problem embedded in that. In other words, a decision that, that the orchestra and I had to make of how not, in fact, to use up all of the energy at once. Sometimes, if you have nothing but unrelenting, fast, and energetic music, at a certain point, it just gets a little bit tiring, and you, you long for the contrast that's built in, frankly, to the classical style. So there is a moment in which, uh, towards the end of, the, of, of this last movement, in which we made a decision together to pull the dynamic back, in other words, to make this music a little bit softer. Now, I'll confess to you, this is not written in the score. Beethoven just writes basically loud from beginning to end. But because of the way he changed harmonies and because of the way he ends the piece, I think it would, be, would have been quite common for a conductor in his day, and certainly uh, it felt like a good decision for us, to move the, back, the music back slightly. Now, why? It's because we want the end to really drive. And so if you can imagine this moment in the last movement is one of drawing the bow back. It comes back, there's great tension by the fact that it is getting a little softer. And then when the music calls for it, and this sort of set of harmonic moments, modulations up by half step, if, 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 you're, if you're interested in that kind of thing, the music then shoots forward. And so we, you'll hear that uh, uh, to some extent, but know that our strategy was to start loud and take advantage of the energy of the, um, of the third movement, and then begin with this kind of invitation to dance, and that at some point just become a little quieter so that we had plenty of room to run towards the, towards the huge ending that Beethoven allows us to do. This was, these were the last sounds we made in last um, summer's festival. And it will be a moment, it still is a moment that, that gives me goosebumps to think of the work that we were all able to do here uh, in Breckenridge uh, together. Musicians, but of course musicians alone cannot make concerts. The staff of Breck Music, Tamara, my colleagues everywhere in, um, and of course you as members of Applause are equal participants. So this is an enormous orchestra that consists of the musicians themselves, but everybody else who is there also to make the music. And we all did this together. So I hope you can sit back and enjoy the absolutely riveting and frankly extravagant end to this seventh Beethoven uh, symphony. Enjoy this. And if you have questions, we'll have a little to, time to chat afterwards. Here it is, last movement.
I miss those musicians. Oh my God, what extraordinary energy and playing and what community and what a thing we're all doing together. I, I, I'm, I'm so touched at this moment. Um, I have a couple of final comments, but I won't keep you long. Is there anybody that would like to share a thought or a, an observation uh, while we're still in that frame of mind? It's, um, it, it's hard to be separated now. It's hard to be apart. It's, it, it, the music, though, reminds us of what it's like to be together. And if we, if we need a moment where, where a little of extra hope and a little, a little promise of good times is in order for us on a given day, then let's think about this music and let's think about what we did together. Because we will come back together, we will play music, we'll play for you, we'll have conversations at the break and afterwards, and we will meet again in the high mountains um, uh, in, at Breckenridge and we'll make beautiful music together. For the moment, I really want to thank Tamara my friends and colleagues at Breck Music, and especially yourselves, for being here for this wonderful reminiscence of the Beethoven Seventh Symphony. Looking forward to seeing you in our future presentations. And until then, be well, be healthy, both in body and spirit. And Brenda and I send our love. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. And thank you again uh, to everybody who joined us here and made a gift to Breck Music to enable our future. We are very excited uh, for this whole series of applause at home. Each and every experience will be a little bit different. So tonight we focused on listening. Um, and as we get further into the summer, there will be events that are focused on conversation, new music, live performances with some of our favorite musicians and genres uh, across the board. So. We hope that you'll come back and see us and enjoy this conversation. And uh, like, like Steve said, um, take this moment to reflect on our experience of the past and enjoy uh, the moments that we have in this new format. So thank you again for, for enabling us to continue to do good work. And uh, again, we'd love to have your feedback. Um, feel free to reach out to any of us in the office or ask questions now. So um, let's see. Looks like we have a, a just a, a standing ovation for Steve, certainly, <laughs> in the chat. Um, and again, stay tuned for more uh, recipes and be in touch with your applause friends and share your moments with us and share your recipes. And we look forward to the next time. Next one is July 10th. So take good care.